Hello, this is Franz Cantor here, cartoonist, illustrator, animator, tune talker, um, and I do caricatures as well. <laughs> so um, I'm here at the Australian Cartoon Museum. It's a cold and miserable day outside, but uh, that's not going to stop us from having some fun. So what are we going to do today? We're actually going to do... Let me show you this picture before we go any further. This is, uh, <clears throat> this is from... I don't know if you can read that signature... This is a, like a note sheet, a fun little thing that he circulated around in the 70s. Who? Uh, the subject of our... Um, Who circulated? Oh, by our, the way, I'm Jim Bridges. caricature. And, um, and I, yes. I helped set up the Cartoon Museum. I'm here with Jim Bridges, yeah, and I'm... he's the president of the Australian Cartoon Museum, and that's where we are today. So and we're, we're and going my to job doing... is to ask him dumb questions. We're going to be doing this guy, Tex Avery. So if... You're familiar with the mask. You're familiar with the idea of the film. Uh, the film, the mask. Yep. So you're familiar with the idea of uh, Tex Avery, some of his uh, cartoons. All right. Um, he was really responsible for uh, this guy, Droopy, and Bugs um, Bunny, Bugs Bunny, Daffy and Duck. Daffy Duck. It's a lot of he, the zany he, characters. He remodelled um, Porky Pig from a pig to um, a Porky. Mm. Uh, Chili Willy. Yep. Uh, what else? Um, this is a caricature that was done by his friend and colleague, Chuck Jones. Mm. And this is him. He's a big guy. This is him in earlier days, Mr. Tex Avery. This is him. Born 1908 and died in uh, 1980. Mm. So um, taken from us too young. But um, this is, I'm actually working on a couple of different uh, photos. So, so I want to try to get some of his girth in because I think that's more. Get the girth in. More ex. ex yeah. Get all the girth ex, in. Yeah, more expressive. But there's, I like this sort of cocky, had this sort of, um, you know, cocky uh, smile. So I want to try to get that in. That's well. in there. Yeah. So I've taken that thumbnail and I've drawn it up mm. so that we can uh, have more fun. Um, the other thing I wanted to just quickly say, which I don't run out of paper up here. Here we go. Just grab that. So he's got a kind of a bean shape. This is what we're trying to aim for, this sort of kidney shape. And, Actually, his, um, his um, middle name is Bean. Is it Mr. Bean? No, B-A-N. And he was related to Judge Roy Bean, the hanging judge. Oh, right. That um, I think the, um, Paul Newman made a film about. Yes. Yeah. So, because, um, because he's, um, he, was, he was born in Texas. Right. And that's why his nickname was Tex. Right. Okay. But his real name was Frederick. Yes. So um, why is he important? Well, he's, um, many people say that he's actually, next to Disney, he's the most p important person in animation. Yep. And he was a great animation director, and as I said, he's invented so many things. Um, just to give you an idea, there's a book that we're going to be reviewing in um, the for the museum in a, in a book by it. This is the world of Tex Avery, and um, you know, just to give you an idea of his scope here, he did the Wolf in um, Red Hot Riding Hood, and that Wolf, of course, was the uh, basis, it's squirrely squirrel. It, it was the basis of squirly the squirrely who? Squirrely squirrel. Squirrely squirrel. He did. Uh, it was the basis of um, the shtick or the the um, extreme uh, poses. Yeah. Well, I mean, he he pushed animation mask. more than anybody else in in, yeah. in in America. Yeah. So you know, this this is right. It's like he is the reason why a lot of people animate. That's right. So he, he did this. These are extremes. These yeah. are sort of extreme takes. The pop off See, the eyes pop off. off. Yeah. yeah, so he had these, um, these, uh, uh, th this sense of humor. So in the world of thinking, if you imagine two, two ways of thinking, there's, there's, a div there's a convergent way of thinking, which is a very sort of narrow, narrow 
point of view. It's a very sort of linear way. And there's also the divergent way of thinking. Well, he's very divergent because his ideas come from left field. They come outside, you know, the off expression the of working outside off, the box. Off the wall. He's, uh, he is definitely outside the box. Yeah. So why is that important? Because that kind of invigorates uh, animation and art. Um, you know, thinking, invigorating mean, meaning giving it more energy and more excitement. Well, apparently when he was working with his uh, colleagues mm. and they'd say something to him, he'd just say, you can do anything in a cartoon. Yeah. He kept re reminding them that there were no limitations. Yeah. And that's why he's important. So we tend to work within our within limitations. We impose limitations. Yeah. His idea was to not look at limitations the same way. But he would push it, like for instance, mm. um, in one gag, in one cartoon. Um, I think Droopy is the the, the sheriff mm. of um, of the town, mm. and he's put a sign up. You know, um, uh, quiet. Yeah. And of course, um, someone bashes their thumb. And he's just about to yell out. Yeah. And um, has to leave the Dro city limits. Dro yeah, Droopy shows him the sign. He holds yeah. up the sign. And so the guy has to run out and scream his head off. And at the end of the cartoon, this gets right out of control. This guy actually has to get on a, in a rocket and go up to the moon and scream his head off. And mm. it just pushes it to such a degree like that, you know. Yeah. So w one gag would be milked. And, um, yeah, and we come up with different um, nth, levels. Nth degree. Yeah. Degree. Not just once, just, you know. Yeah, so probably my favourite um, cartoon of his would be um, Symphony and Slang, which was in the 19, uh, late 1940s, I think. Yeah, or it could he, be the he, 50s. He just animated um, expressions like painting a town red. Yeah. Well, they, these are like the whole idea of cartoon is that you can explore yeah. um, visual, know, visual puns. puns. Yeah, visual puns. And it, it, but, but he combined a story of a bloke's relationship mm. and everything that happened to him in his lifetime, basically. Yeah, um, um, the, the yeah it was a story of the, of the way that he lived and died, lived, yeah. loved and died. Yeah. And, um, and just used all these visual puns and they, and they just punned on top of punned on top of punned and he just yeah, kept... Well, the, the end pun was, I died laughing. So the guy died laughing. That's why he was, he was up in, <laughs> in the pearly gates talking to St. Peter to try to get in. Yeah. You know, but he was so um, enveloped in the, the world of slang that he couldn't really talk um, what's, in what's, plain English. What's that film called again? Symphony in Slang. Yeah, it's actually on um, on YouTube. There's a low res version of it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. you can enjoy that. It's quite um, yeah. uh, it's quite a thing. You know, and he did he did quite a lot of those. Um, Disney did them as well. They did these sort of. Um, adventures. Goofy was actually inspired by uh, um, the antics of um, of Tex Avery, yeah. and he had a lot of the uh, the same sort of uh, documentary style uh, cartoons. You know how to be a golfer, how to be a tennis player, how to be a wrestler, how to be a great fisherman, things like that. Yeah. So they really explored that uh, possibility with. Um, with Goofy. Goofy was more of a Tex Avery figure than anybody else. Yes, um, that's right. He had more um, extreme possibilities of exaggeration. Yeah, because Mickey couldn't do that. No. And Donald would just blow his top. Yeah. yeah. No, they, they just weren't able to, they weren't designed to do that level yeah. of animation. Um, Disney, when he was doing those Goofy cartoons, are basically playing catch-up footy. Yeah, trying to catch up with Tex Avery at the MGM. Over well, at the MGM. Yeah, be careful though, because <laughs> they did catch up. He, oh yeah, they were, they were very they, good. They, they were doing features. Yeah, they were. But I'm saying though, well, no, those, were, goof, those goofy were cartoons are basically goofy is a is a like a a really Tex Avery yes, invention. Yes. Without having to, you know, hire Tex Avery. That's right. So it was a very much uh, inspired by what he was doing over in. Um, in, uh, in MGM, MGM. But, yeah. Anyway, Fred. Um, but Fred... I want to just say something too. This is not done in quiet, by the way. Disney is a very hands-on. Disney was a very hands-on um, producer, so he would have known about the success of Avery. I don't think he ever met him, uh, although I've never heard of the meeting. 
but he would be absolutely aware of uh, you know what's happening at the other end of town. I think everybody would have been in yeah. the field would know. I mean his pets. gags his gags were were extraordinary. They used to carpool in the 40s. Hanna Barbera, sorry, not Hanna Barbera, Joe Hanna, uh, not Bill Hanna, Joe, is it Bill Hanna? Bill Hanna? Yeah, Bill Hanna, Joe Barbera, but Bill yeah. Hanna uh, worked with Tex Avery on at uh, MGM, and uh, they used to carpool, and um, they loved it because uh, Tex Avery would sit in the back and crack jokes, and he was a very funny guy, you yeah. know, he had a wonderful sense of humour. Well, I mean, he started off as a as an inker in in the business. Yeah. But he always was a gag man, and he ended up a gag man because his gags were so funny. Yeah. So, what's a gag man? A gag man is a, is because you're in the in the in the business of doing cartoons here. A gag man is actually a story writer. Yeah. Um, you're actually writing stories visually, so you're presenting these uh, ideas to, you know, to the director. And um, and they're drawn. They're drawn gags. They're like visual cartoons, you know. So in many respects, he had the same sort of sensibilities as some of the best and funniest writers from Mad Magazine. Yeah. So he had a very, um, you know, I mean, in fact, I uh, obviously I wasn't reading uh, Mad Magazine at the same time, but, you know, I was aware that there was something really important going on with uh, his level of humour. They were just, um, they were really, really um, Well, they jumped, they jumped off the screen. They jumped off the... Yeah, there was a lot like, of energy. They're yeah. like Kirby covers. They just jump off the, yeah. off, off the screen. Yeah, exactly. That's a, good, uh, yeah. that's a good analogy. I like that. It's good. Well, he also, I think he was the first cartoonist to break the fourth wall. He was yeah. always, Bugs would lean over to the camera and say, this guy's dumb, you know. Yeah. Whatever, he just, you know, look at the camera. And yeah, well, there's, there's a great one. I can't remember the name of it, but he he had a, um, I think it might have been a, uh, could have been a, a Bugs Bunny cartoon, I don't know. One of the, uh, the dog was the big dog, Blackie is his name yeah. usually. He um, he was an opera singer. And um, um, you'll appreciate this because it's all about the early days of film with projectors rather than, VCRs oh, so and they ran things. off the page. The, well, he had a. There was a hair in the gate. A hair oh. in the gate is is like this hair, persistent hair that flickers. Yes, won't, in the it's projector. Stuck in the it's projector in the projector gate. Yeah. So it was drawn. Yeah. In in the animation. That's right. And the character went doink and plunked it out of the uh, out of the gate. Yeah, but but at the end of the movie. It was in there yeah. was a hair in the gate the whole time. Yeah, and it's animated. Which you think that it's and a real hair. And of course, it drove all the projectionists all over America nuts because they thought it was a real hair. Yeah, until and they the kept on trying to while the projector it. was going. I mean, they kept on. Where's that hair? Blowing, blowing things through it and trying to disconnect the hair. Yeah, and um, it, it caused a big stink. Actually, good. I'm you know, glad. I mean, it uh, for for. for um, for film projectionists, it yeah. was like the, the it was the equivalent of Orson Welles' um, it was radio like, show of um, yeah. the War of the Worlds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or or nailing up a, a, a lobster underneath a table. Ah, yes. Anyway, let, let let's do a bit of biog. He was born in 1908, as you said, mm. and died in 1980. Mm. Um, and he invented Bugs Bunny, mm-hmm. Daffy Duck. He remodelled um, Porky Pig. Yep. Um, Elmer Fudd, he did, and Droopy, Screwy Squirrel, mm-hmm. um, Chilly Willy, mm-hmm. and George and Junior. Do you remember George and Junior? He's got a little little father and big dopey son, big tall dopey son, about four times. He's always in a nappy. These are the bears. He's all, yeah, he's in a nappy. Yeah. Yeah. So Chuck Jones actually did. Uh yeah, he played he, with he, them yeah, in about four yeah, but, films. Yeah, but th- th- they were based on um, the characters in the Mice and Men mm. by you know Steinbeck, the, the American novelist. Yeah, yeah, and he also you know he pushed through with the fourth wall ant attacks, you know, mm. um, and he's famous for saying in a cartoon you can do anything, and he did, he yeah. did, he just did. He also did voice work, so he oh, was I didn't know that. he was. Junior in George and Junior. Oh God! And occasionally he'd do Droopy. You know, right? But he grew up in 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 Texas, 
Um, that's where he got his nickname. And um, yeah, there was a popular phrase at his school, which was "What's up, Doc." Mm. So he put it in the mouth of um, Bugs Bunny, and it just took off. It just mm. took off like those catchphrases that take off in America. America loves their catchphrases. Yeah, well, the you know the the idea of this uh, whole era, of course, these are cartoons that were played before feature films to GIs in the forties. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and also audiences, you know, domestic audiences as well, and foreign audiences. So um, French, the French would get to see American films with his cartoons as a you know um, yeah. before the uh, before the feature. And um, he wanted to be a, a newspaper cartoonist, so he did a course. At, uh, for a couple of months at the Chicago Art Institute mm. and um, um, a carload of his mates went from Texas to LA yeah. and um, in, uh, he was doing most of the driving and of course he decided to stay so they had to, they had to find a driver to get back mm. um, and his first job was a, as an Inca on Oswald the Lucky Rabbit series mm. um, and then he, uh, he went to Walter Lance um, Walter um, Lance did Woody studio. Woodpecker. Yeah. Well, this is very early. Yeah. Um, doing inking, but he quickly became an animator by 1930. Yep. Um, but, you know, while messing around in the studio... Because Woody the, Woodpecker is Walter Lance's version of Daffy Duck. Yeah, that's true. And very irritating. Mm. Whereas I didn't find Daffy at all irritating. Um, you, you've got him. I think a lot of people loved yeah. um, Woody Woodpecker. Me. Well, he had a bloody song for a start, didn't he? Yeah. And um, what was it? Um, his wife used to do the voice. Mel the... Blank. No, but I think his wife. It's, it's something about Walter Lance no. and Woody Woodpecker with with his wife. There's some connection. Uh, I don't know that, but I yeah. know. Anyway, because animators are sitting around cracking jokes and drawing funny pictures and stuff, they were all messing around, and they used to shoot. Um, pellets at each other, you know, paper pellets. Mm, spitballs. Yeah, and one guy put a, a paper clip into his rubber band and Ooh, flicked it yeah. at the back of Tex over his head and someone yelled out, look out Tex, and Tex turned, turned around, around got it in the eye. He got him in the eye and he was blinded oh in that God. eye forever. And some people said that, that because of his lack of depth perception, hmm. that influenced... Um, the way he did cartoons, like he, he sort of got rid of backgrounds in mm. a lot of his cartoons. He, he like they always had people doing backgrounds in MGM and that. And um, he 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 started to dispense with backgrounds. Um, and also they they say it's to do with his bizarre direction as mm. a director, but I don't I, I doubt that you know. Anyway, so he wasn't terribly happy with his wages with Mr. Lance. So no, he um, he deliberately. Um, turned in inferior work and ended up getting sacked because he wanted to leave and he went over to Leon Schlesinger yep. Productions which later became Warner Brothers yep. cartoons and he he bullshitted his way into, into a director's job he'd, he'd done some directing um, partial directing at with Walton Lance but he claimed he was an experienced director so he got the job right and of course, um, when he was in Warner Brothers, that's the famous Termite Terrace, which was a five-room bungalow. Yeah. And it was called the Termite Terrace because apparently they did have a termite problem. All oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> and he 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 started off um, redefining um, Porky Pig straight away because Porky Pig was basically a pig. Mm. I don't even know if he had pants on, you know. No, Porky never had pants. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Um, no, jacket. but I'm saying he was more like a pig, like an actual animal. Oh, so okay. So he sort of changed him more into a... Um, a cartoon character. Yeah, into a cartoon, yeah. 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 Um, and, of course, he was, uh, he, was, he was adding a lot of the gags because that, that's what he was. He was a gag man. He was a born gag man, you know? He couldn't help himself. No. Yeah. But he also had access to the editing and the timing of the gags. Yeah, you know. Um, so he he would um, they'd finish the work and he'd look at it and said no. We'd, he'd retime it. We'd, we'd need to cut five frames here. Yeah. And you know, there's one, there's twenty four frames per second. Mm. So he was, you know, he was, 
he was at that level. He he believed in timing. Yeah. Very important. He says humour is all about timing. Yeah. yeah. I think everybody, all of the comedians would uh, would be aware of that. Would be part of their. Um, Anyway, he he was he was a um, I mean he was Corbyn. a huge influence at, at Warner Brothers, mm. um, and he influenced um, a lot of the people he worked with. But he wasn't here that long, really. Um, and he had ideas, like for instance, he had the idea of um, of getting um, footage, filmed footage of animals, mm. and getting them to talk, to, to, you know, as if they could talk. All and right. And of course, he went to Leon Schlesinger. Yeah. And he wasn't at all interested in it, so he sold the idea over to Paramount, where they did it. They did a series called Speaking Animals, which lasted seven years. Wow. So he went over and worked for a while at Paramount. He left uh, the Warner Brothers. Mm. It's funny, because um, most people remember his Warner Brothers work, not his MGM work, but he was at MGM for 14 years. Mm. So in 1941, he went to MGM, and he loved it there because they offered him larger budgets, and they went along with a lot of his crazy ideas. Mm. Um, and his first film was Blitz Wolf, yeah, which is um, a Hitler parody. Yeah, and it was nominated for an Academy Award. He didn't get one, but it was you know. Mm. And as I said before, um, he came up with these characters like George and Junior, uh, which was a parody of John Steinbeck's Mice and Men novel, mm. which is a great novel. I suggest you. It's a very, it's a short novel. You should read it. It's very good. Been yeah, made into you a asking film. me to read it? Yeah, no. been made into a film many times mm -hmm. and plays. Who does the audiobook? I don't know, but it's, it'll be done. Uh, also, he came up with Red Hot Riding Hood yep. and Droopy. Um, yeah, anyway, um, he went over to Walter Lance after about 14 years mm. and came up with Chilly Willy, which I never liked. Do you, you like Chilly Willy? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's a penguin that. Um, it's a cute little. Penguin. It's a, just a cute little character, but you know, and, yeah. and the Eskimo always tries to get him. Yeah. And that was, um, I think, it was. I think it was in, in a Bugs cartoon, wasn't it? Bugs Bunny, Warner Brothers. No, I'm not sure, but anyway, um, while he was with Walter Lance, two of his cartoons were also again nominated for Academy Awards. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and then um, in the um, in the 60s and 70s, he he left feature films because uh, feature films were dying anyway. Uh, and he went over to I mean uh, sorry he never got into feature films. He was just like um, short cartoons sort of died. TV's coming along, you know. Mm. So he got into commercials, and he's famous for raid cartoons, which were like yeah. What are they like? Because I know nothing about them except that they're like more teenagers, aren't they? Yeah, they got bugs. Aren't, aren't Louis the Fly based on them? Right? Yeah, you know. Yeah, like they just yell out "raid" and the, the bugs would drop dead. Yeah, you know, that's I, I vaguely remember something like that. And Frito Bandito. Yeah. Do you remember that? No. Well, he was a character for Bandito. I don't know what they were. It was Mexican food. Yeah, and Kool Aid. He did a lot of ads for Kool Aid using um, the Warner Brothers Looney Tunes characters. Yeah. Um, and of course his um, legacy is pretty interesting because um, without Tex Avery you wouldn't have Rem and Stimpy no you wouldn't have Roger Rabbit you wouldn't have Animanic, uh, Anim Animaniacs Ma Animaniacs that's right yeah and you yeah. wouldn't have Spongebob no so he's a he's a big deal he's a big uh, he's a big name in um, animation and you know he's well loved yeah and um you know, we all have like Tex Avery favorite. They're usually scenes, you know, from some film that uh, that he directed. Um, there's one um, where I think it's a good deed, um, Droopy's good deed. I think it could be called um, with Blackie again, the, um, the the protagonist, and he's just got this beautiful walk. I, I show my animation students this uh, walk. Um, that this this dog has trying to be a, a, a boy scout in this tiny um he's got this little um boy scout uniform on yeah that doesn't fit so his big stomach yeah, sticks yeah, out yeah, and yeah. and he's just got this incredible um manic uh 
personality that uh, that you know is just adorable, um, and it's because Drupi was very under expressive. All of the other characters were over expressive. Yeah, all me, all my. Yeah. So that was, the, the, you know, the contrast was yeah. so funny in those films. But Droopy was also um, an earlier character yeah. um, where um, the wolf was trying to do stuff mm. and didn't matter how much he, he ran and, 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 and did stuff to out, out with him, Droopy would nope. just be always there. Like the little character, like Droopy, would be just there so he could never beat him. He could never yeah, beat it was him. the, the mounty... Um, yeah. Episode. It, I the think. Ever gets it was. There was. Yeah. It was. It was a couple of um, things where he uh, actually did that, and just the outlandish um, up upmanship. One up. What do they call one upmanship of each of the gags? Yeah. So you get one gag, and then he'd milk it. Yeah. Just, into like unbelievable yeah. <laughs> excesses. Yeah, he'd, unbelievable he'd build excesses. It up, he'd build it up from a little thing to almost cosmic. Um, yeah. Um, expansion. Yeah. yeah. And uh, sometimes it would be the same gag, you know, in one film would appear and again in another film. And, but this time, of course, the volumes turned up. So um, everything about that, uh, that uh, joke is bigger. Yeah. Yeah, um, um, that's right. Everybody's got their own... Um Tex Avery favourite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's usually based on scenes like a like a walk here or yeah. an antic here. Or some extreme. Or the you know, the wolf doing wolf whistles yeah, the eyes, red riding the, the or eyes a stripper. Popping off, the eyes po- popping off. Yeah. The neck stretching out, you know. Yeah, but each time you'd have different reactions. Yeah. So there was never um uh the same, you know, take. Uh each time there would be a, a, some new um invention that he'd come up with. Yeah. And this is the this is everything about Tex Avery. He he was so inventive. It's so um exciting to see the possibilities. This is when I started to talk about the left brain or the right brain or the the fact that you've got um two kinds of thinking, you know, convergent thinking which is li- lateral and linear and divergent thinking. This man is divergent to to the nth degree. He came up with uh, ideas, it's, you know, like if, if convergent thinking is to arrive at the what, the answer to the question what. Yeah. Convergent thinking, which is all Tex Avery, is what if. And this is why his um, legacy is so important well, um, to cartoon. You have, you, have, um, you have right brain and you have left brain mm. and you've got Tex Avery. <laughs> He he just went beyond. Yeah, but I, I most think... people's expectations, or what they expect, he just pushed it. You yeah, know? that's why he's so important because it, it, it gets back to you know, um, in animation, you can do anything. Yeah, and but always always you, you surprise yourself. Yeah, and yeah. surprise, surprise yes. the audience. The you know once you surprise yourself, yeah. he used to. It, I could imagine him being surprised. This is the kind of guy that would um, have this idea for a gag and just wouldn't let it go. Um, the gag had to had to live, so yeah, no but, matter but, what. But but he allowed it to grow. That's the yeah. point. You see, most most cartoons, uh, well, most uh, people working with him let him go with that. Yeah, but most cartoons have a gag followed by a ingenious. different gag, followed by a different gag, for a, a different gag. But he would just keep that gag going. Mm. You know, like a running joke. You know. Yeah, but visually, um, and in two thousand and eight, um, which was um, his hundredth year uh, anniversary of, of his birth, mm. France, uh, of all places, issued um, three postage stamps. Yeah, one with Droopy, one with the wolf, and one with the with Red. And the Red, Red is riding her. Her name was Red. She didn't have a name, but they call her Red. Yeah. And it was always funny because she always fixed up the wolf at the end. She was always in control. And yeah. he, was, he was just off his nut with, with lust, frothing at the mouth and everything else. Heart, you know, coming out of his body, bang, 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 bang. And the other thing is you can also see his influence in anime. I can see it in anime, you know. 
In, 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 in Japanese animation. Okay. What? How? Oh, I, well, I, I can't really think what? of any examples, but I mean, I've, I've, I've sat through hundreds of hours of anime, and you just, ah, oh, it's the Tex Avery feeling there, you know? You just... Mm. I mean, you know, he's, um, a, as you said, um, he's the second most important person in America. Next to, to Disney. Yeah. Next to Disney in animation. Mm. And that's saying something, because there's some, they produce some great people, you know? Yeah. While you're, um, while you're there, I just want to read some things, you know. Yeah. This is out of the book. Um, <clears throat> Tex Avery is considered the most important influence on Hollywood studio cartoons after Walt Disney. The career of this legendary director, who created Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck and Droopy, among others, mm. spanned 50 years and took him to most of the major cartoon studios, including Walter Lance, Warner Brothers and Jim Jim, and, and Hanna-Barbera. We did mention that. He mm. ended up as a as a joke writer for Hanna-Barbera. Mm. And I think he was working um, two weeks before he died even. Um, he had a heart attack at, at work and the boss... Um, um, drove in the hospital. Yeah, drove in the hospital. And he ended up dying in the same hospital that Walt Disney did. Mm. Yeah. Um, his innovative directoral spark dazzled and inspired colleagues such as Chuck Jones, Bob Clanton and Frank Cashton all of whom went on to become industry stars themselves. Mm. Avery had a long tenure at MGM's cartoon unit where his high-octane, uninhibited, joyously cartoony ideas flowered into some of the greatest and funniest animated film shorts ever made. Mm. Um, yeah, we've um, mentioned that. Yeah, The Mask, the film The Mask is, is basically his film, isn't it? All the, all the, the effects of what happens in the mask have mm. been done before in cartoon form. You know? Yeah. So it's basically uh, with Jim Carrey a CG version of um, you know the um, the wolf. Yeah. And um, Chuck Jones who was influenced by him very much mm. he actually um, in the introduction to this book that we're about to do in another film mm. He, he said uh, what, what, um, what he taught him was, one, mm. you must live what you caricature. Yeah. You must not mock it unless it is ridiculously self-important like the solemn live-action travelogues of the 1930s. Yeah. Two, you must learn to respect the golden atom, that single frame of action, that one twenty-fourth of a second, because the difference between lightning... And the lightning bug may hinge on that single frame. Mm. Three, you must respect the impulsive thought and try to imp implement it. You cannot perform as a director doing what you already know. Yes, there you go. You must depend on the flash of inspiration that you yep. do not expect and do not know. So it's almost like um, listen to your whimsy or yes. your, you know, your what ifs. Yes. And. Um, cater to that and try to implement them in your work. And directors will tell you it that, gives it fresh... Yeah, film directors will tell you that all the time, how while they're, they're following the script, someone will come up with something that turns out to be the best part in the film that's not even in the script because mm. and they allow it to be in, you know? Yeah. It just comes out of nowhere, you know? You must always remember that only man of all creatures can blush or needs to, and that if you are in the trade of helping others to laugh and to survive by laughter, then you are privileged indeed. Mm. Remember, oh, number five, remember that character is all that matters in making, in the making of great comedians, in animation or in live action. Yep. And six, keep always in mind your heart and your hand that timing is the essence, mm. the spine, the electrical magic of humour and of animation. Mm. So, you know, oh, that's something. Yes, he was born with the gift of laughter and a belief that the world was mad. Mm. So, um, you know, these like you can all, you can crap on about um, modern directors and things and how you know brilliant they are and you know great filmmakers and stuff like that. But this guy had it over everybody else. He had this incredible sense of humor and an imagination that fed it. 
and um, you know, and he was an undeniable force of nature. So it, he had to be, you know, this sense of humor, these gags that he wrote, um, they had to be given life. Um, it's because they were so, um, you know, expressive and and ex they express life, what life was all about. It's you know? um, it's a pity because life's about all of these extraordinary moments, and he's responsible yeah. for a whole bunch of those extraordinary yeah. moments. Yeah, but it's a pity because he missed out on the on the, on the features. Yeah, you know, like the um, the independent features that were coming out in the. 60s and 70s, you know, um, he was an old man by then, burnt out. But um, it's a pity that, that there's no feature film of of his work because I just wonder what he'd do. Mm. I mean, because he was such a gag man, I mean, they'd be full of um, all sorts of. Um, I don't know if if he ha actually had the ability to structure uh, a story, a long to, narrative. Yes, I don't know if he could could have done that. Well, but, but we'll, we'll never know, really. Yes. It's not not something that. Um, but he, he might have blossomed with Beyond it. You never know. He might have actually probably uh, turned out the, the most, um, uh, you know, Salvador Dalish type of humour ever, uh, you know, created in animation. You don't know. You kind of get an idea if you look at, you know, Roger Rabbit, which is a film. Yes. You kind of get an idea that it would have been possible, you know. Yes. Um, and that's all that's that's really necessary. We just sort I of mean, if, think if, about it. I mean, if you and me put on Roger Rabbit... Be, and just stood there while it was going and just yelled out Tex Avery every time there was a Tex Avery thing. I mean, we'd be yelling out a lot, wouldn't we? Yeah. Um, the other thing is, um, my I've got a memory of going, they had a, um, years ago at Melbourne um, Film Festival in, in Melbourne uh, at the Palais, St Kilda, they had, um, they had a whole series of his films that went for about two hours. Right. In, in one Sunday afternoon. And people laughed that much there was just so much laughter going on mm. that when the, the interval happened oh, 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 people oh, were exhausted oh they're absolutely exhausted people were having heart attacks oh, people were just mm. you know just um tr you know relearning to breathe again and yeah yeah they were going out into the foyer looking for a drink or, or just some air out in the street and it was cold but they didn't care they just wanted to get some air because they'd gone through i mean they it's like being um, tickled by an expert or something for yeah. two hours, mm. you know, you just couldn't stand it. Your whole body was sort of shaking with, with excess, you know, yeah. because of his humour. And they they did a good job because they put the films on in in the in not chrono chronological order, but in mm. order of of their expansion of these ideas. Right. So they build up yes. one on the other. And I'll never forget that because people just came out with, with holding their chests and things. They had actual pain, you know? Mm. Stitches and things, you know? When they say... I'd like to get... To when, the, when, when you hear that phrase, that, stitches, uh, you know, they were in stitches of laughter, mm. it's exactly what it was. It's the only time I've ever seen it, you know? <laughs> mm. That's a great... Um, incredible talent. Incredible talent. Very inspiring. Mm. I'm just gonna get a bit of contrast going here. I'm um, working with. I I, I always like thought that um, the best of Daffy Duck form. cartoons were the early ones with Bob, yeah. Bob Clampett did mm. during the war, but I I didn't realise just how much input this bloke had to those. Daffy Duck, because he'd be bouncing off the screen on the corners. He was just bouncing all over the screen, wasn't he? Yeah. Well, he did something extraordinary that um, no, no, no other character had that um, that flexibility until you know. Well, not the manic flexibility. He's kind of like in between Goofy and and Donald. So he had a lot of the yeah, but he, he's aggressive. Sort of, he was aggressive, but um, his his um, his humour was much more adult than what was happening over at Disney. Yeah, I mean you had you know well, Mike, made for you had Michael Maltese. Yeah, yeah, they were. You they had were. all these incredible people. You know, you had um, Mel Blanc. Um, mm. You know, um, uh, Chuck Jones. You had all these extraordinary people. But he was like the um, the conductor. Yeah. You know, and he set the pace. 
or the or, or you know he just you know by telling his, his people he's working with you know there are no you know you can do anything you want yeah in in animation in cartoons you can do anything well you it's want. kind of permission to yeah um, that's exactly right have and fun it's funny how people need permission yeah it's like you know people are worried about turning 50 and basically i tell people that well when you turn 50 you now have permission to do anything you you, you ever wanted to do mm. because what's stopping you and really nothing has ever been stopping you it's just for some reason you think oh i can't do that you know but when you turn 50 mm. well why not just go for it you know yeah well people make excuses don't that's they? right all their life I, I can't do my bucket list why not i haven't got a bucket <laughs> there's a hole in the bucket dear henry dear henry mm. That's so, not bad. Let's get some black going on. That's not here. bad. Try and see how far I think, we can um, get with it. I think there's not too many pictures of um, this no. fellow out there in the zeitgeist, and I think that might um, end up being um, latched on by quite a few people. Well, it's interpretive, isn't it? You've got to have... Yeah, um, well, you've got, you're taking it from three pictures. Yeah. And the main one's out of focus as usual. Yeah. So you just basically um, use your knowledge of anatomy to put in what should be there rather than what is there or what you see there, which is kind of a conflict really because generally when you draw from life, you rely on what you see. This time you're relying on less of, on partly of what you see, but more of what you feel. Mm. So it's a different um, sensibility, I guess, or kind of a, a, an awareness. It's a bit scary, but you know, hey, we're here to be scared, really. Um, I'm just gonna. I think I'll leave the hair, but I'm going to thicken up some of these outlying contours just to have them stand out a little bit. I haven't decided what to do in the background yet, but... So, you know, growing up uh, looking at Tex Avery cartoons like Droopy and things, um, Obviously, Droopy is not something that impresses impresses you because he's completely deadpan. Yeah. But everybody else is running around like a maniac. It's crazy. Yeah, the, yeah. the energy, you know, the the um, the energy that he puts into these um, antics, these gags, sell the gags, and sometimes the gags are really corny, you know. So he gets into um, metaphors and and puns and things like that, and yeah, really gets very corny. Um, they're very corny, but he sells them because of his incredible um, abilities. Well, Droopy is standing around like um, the foundation of a gag, mm. and everything else is flying around him at breakneck speed, and he's just standing there. I mean, the only time we, you ever see him moving fast is when he pulls up a sign in front of him that says, you know, uh, silence, you know, yeah, or quiet, or something like that, you know. <clears throat> well, he's he's kind of like a uh, self-parodying um, character. You don't yeah. know whether he's being sarcastic yeah. or what, but uh, you know, it, it's just sort of like a a fo it's a foil yeah. to um, counteract yes, the yes. energy that's but, going on with the villain or yeah. with the other character. Yeah. Um, and the other character, because you know, if it's Blackie, you'll usually get. Um, in trouble because of the uh, because he's not um, subdued. He's not. See the the idea of, of a character that doesn't exact doesn't have exaggerated movements is really to um, you know uh, it's pointing the finger at us and saying see how subdued you are, see how normal you are. Um, I'm trying to get some ink out of this thing. It's better. 
Um, and, you know, the, the big bad wolf or blackie or someone would be um, the opposite. So they, they're, they're um, motivated by greed or by, you know, um, lust. Uh, lust or other emotions. So they're um, up for um, karma, sort of a karmic revenge, you know. Mm. Um, I think one of the, uh, I think it's Red Hot Riding Hood or something, um, where the wolf is lusting after red and the grandma is lusting after the wolf. Mm. So he ends up with the wrong, the wrong broad. Yeah. You know, which is part of the revenge, I guess, mm. of that era. I know it's not a nice thing to say, but it's funny because it's um, it's the it's the the, the revenge of um, it's the revenge of the uh, of karma. Hmm. So, you know, the the idea of cartoon physics, of course, that cartoons have always exploited the idea of physics and breaking physics, you know. Um, Bugs Bunny stopping a, uh, a, a plane from crashing with air brakes. So it was a gag-driven, uh, you know, ending of the film. Um, the idea of uh, um, a character... Um, sneaking around a corner and actually conforming to the shape of the corner you know so that it's his shape is 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 sort of dis, um distorted by um a feeling of anti physics mm. um so I remember one thinking. gag um a train track turns right angles yeah and the train just follows it around you know yeah and of course it's, <laughs> it's impossible yeah, but the idea that that you know in a cartoon you can do anything, yeah. so you have uh, really you've broken the rules. Um, well, it comes already. off the tracks, but, but to it, break it to that it extent, it comes off the tracks, but it goes back on the tracks. You know. Yeah, but to break it to that extent is you know it's just ingenious. Mm. So he had like that um, all the time, and. Even on you know um, simpler productions like his uh, his uh, mock um, PSAs, you know the um, the car of tomorrow, the house yeah. of tomorrow. Yeah. Um, you know they they all had these that puns that would never survive. Yeah. Um, well, they were co they were too corny. Yeah, to survive. they would never survive. But he made them work, and yeah. he made them funny. Yeah. You know, because it was to do with the timing and the outlandishness of the of the premise. Um, he was a big bloke, but you can imagine him jumping around um, telling the yeah. gag, can't you? Well, like, ex animators ex are explaining the gag to the yeah. Animate animate animators are physical. They're yeah. very physical. You have to be. Yeah, that, that's what he said. You have to live. You're going to get up out You of have your... to live the caricature. Yeah, you're caricaturing something. You have to live that. You know. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, it would have been interesting to see him um, jumping out of his chair and uh, doing mm. these sort of uh, acting out these antics and these actions and things um, to try to, you know, feed the, um, feed the joke. Well, the trope of the wolf, you know, um, chasing Little Red Riding Hood and, and how women call men wolves because, you know, they're after them. Mm. I mean, that, he didn't invent that. He just... No, he capitalised on it to such a degree, you know. Yeah, well, well they're these... mixed metaphors. Yeah, it's taking the you know, they, look. They're not the cartoons are not for kids. They're no. not for kids. No, because the themes are adult. But the, but the and... kids like the action. Yeah, they like the extreme action. The energy. Yes, mm. and they understood it. Yeah, you know. Yeah. I remember as a kid looking at films adult films and thinking they're boring what's all this stuff about mm. what's this lovey dovey stuff and that you know with but, films yeah but, but not but, cartoons that's right um cartoons i are, grew up I, I, and you're talking my language yeah i grew up in a um you know totally dominated by um by disney but um mm. as you grow older you just 
cross over, don't you? Yeah. To Warner Brothers. So this is Tex, the big guy himself, you know? Mm. And um, there would be no animation, probably. There, there would be animation, but it would suck. Um, so this is uh, it's a younger version of Tex. So but he would kind have, of base it up. Yeah. All he, of these. He wouldn't have lasted pictures. five minutes at Disney, do you think? Well, he, he had was, an influence on Disney. Doesn't yeah, really matter. Yeah, but he, but he never he never worked for Disney. It's the only major studio he didn't work for. Mm. It doesn't matter though. No, at the end of no, the day. no. This is uh, Tex Avery, and this is Tex Avery, and this is France Cantor, and I'm here with Jim Bridges, and we'll catch you on, on the, the flip, flip side. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you, Tex. Thank you.